Hello, and welcome to the 7th Annual Bay Area Book Festival. I'm Sherilyn Parsons, the founder and director of the festival, and uh, we are delighted to introduce tonight's event, which is a special Mother's Day event and the closing event of this year's festival. So Karen Phillips um, joined Words Without Borders eight years ago, following earlier work all over the world as a nonprofit administrator and policy researcher. And she will introduce our three featured authors and lead our roundtable. So Karen, take it away. Welcome to the seventh annual Bay Area Book Festival. Thank you so much for your introduction, Sherilyn. As she said, I'm Karen Phillips, and I'll be moderating today's discussion with Avni Doshi, Maza Mengiste, and Alia Trabuco Zeran. Just to introduce our authors, Avni Doshi was born in New Jersey and lives in Dubai. Her first novel, Burnt Sugar, won the 2021 Sushila Devi Award and was long listed for the 2019 Tata First Novel Prize. Upon publication in the UK, Burnt Sugar was shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize and was named a 2020 Book of the Year by The Guardian, Economist, Spectator, and NPR. Now to Maza, born in Addis Ababa, Maza Mengiste is the author of The Shadow King, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize, and as well as an LA Times Book Prize finalist and a Best Book of 2019 by the New York Times, NPR, Time, Elle, and other publications. Beneath the Lion's Gaze, her debut, was selected by The Guardian as one of the 10 best contemporary African books. And Alia Trabuco Seran, Born in Chile, um, is author of La Resta, or The Remainder, her debut novel, which was granted a Best Literary Work Award from the Chilean Council for the Arts and was shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize in 2019. She is also the author of Las Homicidas, or The Murderers, a nonfiction book about women who kill that we can look forward to being published in English later this year. Hello, everybody. It's really a great honor to be with the three of you, all of you in different time zones and in three different countries, to talk about your powerful novels today. Um, I wanted to start today with the title of this event, which takes its name from the famous lines of the Muriel Rekaiser poem, which was written in tribute to the German artist Kette Kulwitz. And um, if you're not familiar with her prints, they, they tell the story of, of um, they tell truths about the impact of war and poverty on working classes and particularly on women and children. And Rukeyser writes, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. So the woman who tells the truth then has this kind of power, perhaps a dangerous power to break the world, though possibly to remake it in this poem. And I wanted to ask you guys a little bit about how you responded to this designation of dangerous writer and how your work, which does tell often intense and uncomfortable truths about women's lives and about history, um, stories that are often not told, um, what you would say to this idea about the danger of telling truths in your books. Why don't we start uh, with Alia? Well, thank you. First, uh, Karen, thank you so much for, for this uh, invitation. I'm really thrilled to be able to talk to you and to Maza and Avni uh, this morning. Uh, and, and hey, hello, everyone who's watching us today. Um, I think uh, it's a great question, um, really. Uh, and my first uh, counter question would be uh, a danger to what, right? Um, because... Uh, for me, like that, that second question, a danger to what, will, will make us reflect about uh, what norm we are breaking uh, when writing, for example, in my case, about memory, uh, or in the case of, of my second book, uh, the Las Homicidas, or um, Women Who Kill, about um, these women who somehow um, are challenging the, the very meaning of being a woman, um, very much in the line of, of, of Maza's uh, book as well. Um, so um, for me, uh, uh, how, how danger is defi defined and, and what, what it's challenging really is the most uh, interesting question because there is a norm that says how, uh, in the case of Chile and Chilean memory in particular, that 
was kind of um, setting a narrative of how we had to um, remember the past, the dictatorial past, and somehow my novel was trying to say this is a bit more complicated, um, and and that is also that is dangerous uh, towards a narrative that was trying to say well let's just forget a bit more and let's just focus in the future, you know. Uh, so that that definitely sets. Um, it challenges uh, the, the the narrative that was trying to be set up by those in power. Laza, um, when Ali was speaking, I was thinking about what you've said about the kind of push to move forward beyond the history that you talk about and the truths you tell in The Shadow King. I wonder if you'd like to jump in on this next. Yeah, uh, and thank you, Karen, for the question. It's really wonderful to be here, to see Avni again, and to speak with Aliyah. Um, I, I was thinking about the uh, what Aliyah was just saying about dangerous to whom. And I also wanted to think about how we define danger and what that actually means, especially when... Uh, you know, we are still continuing to discuss uh, now the 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 kinds of um, violences that women have been subjected to uh, from centuries, millennia, but particularly in, in more recent times, women are becoming more open and talking about their experiences. So um, I'm looking at that word danger and thinking about um is that being defined? Is it dangerous for men to feel uncomfortable? Uh, and is that discomfort uh, a danger to women uh, once they start uh, making noise and, and starting to disrupt the system? Um, the, the work of the artist uh, that you mentioned, uh, Kate, and I know that I will get her last name wrong, has been something that I've been looking at for, uh, it's interesting, for a number of years and thinking about the ways that um, the, the people that she drew, the poverty that she forced um, people to, to look at in, in her drawings and um, s some of her um, other work, I found very powerful and it was unsettling uh, for the time that she was in. Um, I think women are supposed to be unsettling. Uh, I think that's that's the work of what writing does is to disrupt and uh, force difficult questions uh, forward. But I think the danger uh, is not what women do, but it's what they're met with when when they do uh, they do make um disruptions in the system. Thanks, Plaza. Turning to Avni, um, I'm just thinking from the very first line of your book, you, your, your main character, Antara, she, she disrupts and she disturbs. And I think you've talked about, you know, how, how, how people in general have an issue with the difficult woman, the woman who says and reveals things that go against the, the predominant narrative. I'm curious how you respond to this idea of danger and, and what how, how dangerous is this, this woman in your book? Um, you know, I confess it wasn't something I really thought about consciously when I, when I started writing Burnt Sugar, but I realized through the process that um, there were these spaces of silence and I found that the more I wrote into those spaces of silence and brought language to them and perhaps gave them kind of um, a shape, uh, particularly these ideas of, you know, in my novel in particular, this idea of maternal ambivalence, um, a mother who isn't really a giver of life, but is perhaps uh, a giver of death. Um, I realized that there, you know, there was all this resistance and it, it came up, there was a lot of criticism and I could feel that people um, were sort of reacting to the characters and, and it made me question even more, you know, these silences, um, who are they in service to? Um, what systems and what structures are they um, holding up? 
and and as you give language to them and as you give shape to them how do how do those systems then you know end up on um more unstable ground in a sense so that really only i think you know it's interesting how you can start with a character and a compelling a story that you personally find compelling and um how how everything really just can emerge from there in ways that are completely unexpected so that that's something that was just really exciting to me um about the process it's something that i really never knew about the process of writing until i began to write my first book sounds like it must have been in a way very freeing to have that experience and and make the space to talk in these silences in ways that you know maybe perhaps we haven't heard these voices before um i want to since mothers have come up and since it is Mother's Day here in the United States, um, in Keta Kolvitz's images, it's usually, it's oftentimes a mother figure you see as kind of bearing the hardship of everything around her. Um, in, in, in her case, in World War I and World War II. And in your novels, the focus is at least, although there's a lot of mothers, especially in Burnt Sugar, but I have focused a lot on the daughter. Um, and thinking about, um, of course, Antara, who's in this existential crisis intertwined with her shared history, with her neglectful, um, difficult, um, also independent mother, um, Hirut, the heroine of the Shadow King, who is bearing, seems to be bearing this weight, you know, from her parents who are not, who are not alive in, in the novel, but are very present kind of as ghosts and in her understanding of what she's supposed to do. And even that pressure made manifest in the object of a, a gun, a very heavy gun, this, this pressure on her as a daughter. And then Ikela, the, the, one of the main characters in The Remainder, who is this somewhat lost, um, very attentive daughter, carrying her mother's anxiety and depression from the years of the dictatorship and the fallout. And, you know, we're, thinking about Mother's Day, but also thinking of, of the struggle of the daughter um, and the filial duties that traditionally fall to, to women and girls. Um, and when you thought about the paths of these characters or as you created them, were you thinking of, I was thinking often as I read them about freedom and if there's, you know, is there a way for them to break through to realize themselves given these pressures of being the daughter, or are stakes too high in society that they find themselves in? Um, I don't know. Um, Maza, do you want to start us out this time? Uh, sure. <clears throat> Thank you for that question, Karen. I was thinking about uh, a moment in my novel uh, when Aster, who is the the woman that, that Hirut serves, uh, tells her, uh, you know, you you forget your place in this world. Your mother knew her place uh, as a maid to Aster, and and uh, Hirut now is trying to is chafing against that role of just servant and basically a non entity in this household. And she says, um, "You were you think that you were." You think that the world is supposed to bend around you, but your mother understood her place and you need to understand that you were made to fit in the world. Um, and I, uh, I think often about the, the, the complicated positions that women in power hold over other women. Um, I was wanting to explore some of that. It, it could be mother-daughter, it could be Hirut, who has been left this legacy of servitude uh, because uh, her mother was a servant, her father was a farmer. She has a path that was set for her and yet she, she wants to push against that and, and she thinks that this coming war gives her an opportunity to upend expectations of her. Uh, she could be possibly a soldier she works for Aster, who feels like she too can be a soldier, but Aster has very clear ideas of the hierarchy in society, and she is above Hirut, and she'll never let her forget that. Um, I was looking at these complicated dynamics, and 
what that legacy of that that rifle that you mentioned, Karen, um, how it symbolizes a promise to Hirut. Um, it symbolizes violence. Her father tells her, once you shoot this gun, you're going to be someone that you have never been before. Um, but she wants to take up that challenge. And I think it raises questions about this, the other question you raised about dangerous women and how dangerous do women actually need to be in order to, um, to have some level of freedom in, in a patriarchal society. Thanks, Moza. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point about what, what has to be done for these characters in order to break, three, uh, break free. And Avni, I'm thinking about what happens in your book. And of course, um, it's okay to talk about it. It's not too big of a spoiler, but for Antara, who ends up becoming pregnant. Um, and I wonder if, if that was an attempt you know, looking as a, in, in a way, an attempt initially to, to break out or to break free and maybe an, an unsuccessful one ultimately. I'm curious about that, the role of the daughter and then her decision to become mother, which was very much her, her choice. I mean, she, she willed that into being, it didn't happen by accident. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to think about Tara and Antara and this question of freedom and then the choices Antara makes. Um, because I, I suppose in a lot of ways, I saw Tara, the mother, as the one who was really um, breaking free in a very concrete sense. I mean, she was married, uh, she, she um, enters into an arranged marriage, a loveless marriage, and she, instead of staying, even once she has a daughter, she runs away from it and she leaves and she kind of enters a realm. Um, she enters this ashram, which is kind of outside of polite society in a lot of ways. Um, she's the lover of this guru there and, um, and then continues to live her life very much according to her desires. And in a way, when I was writing Tara, I was thinking of what would a woman look like who was like pure desire manifest, you know, like how would a woman like that be and how would she act without the kind of um, pressures of society holding her back? What would, a, what would it look like if she could really live her life unhampered? And in a way, that's kind of where this idea of Tara came from. And Anthara is actually, even though she's kind of the younger generation and the daughter, and one might think that she is the one who's going to kind of break barriers. In a way, I think she, because her mother made all these decisions and then they had to bear the brunt of them because society punishes, uh, at least my understanding and my experiences are society really punishes women who, um, dare to step outside of these kind of narrow confines that are that are like set out um, for them. And Anthara grows up seeing that and grows up experiencing that. And I think to some degree, she is fearful, um, you know, of truly um, breaking out of of these confines um, as her mother has. And so she searches for, I think a lot of the, she searches for um, a lot of the kind of normative signs of like being a good woman that her mother rejected. You know, so she, she wants to be married and she wants to, um, she questions having a child, but then she realizes that having a child is the way to be kind of enmeshed in this, um, in this, uh, this particular kind of nuclear family. So, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I, I saw Anthara and Tara as kind of opposites in that way. Um, and I think they, um, and that's another reason why as mother and daughter, they, they're constantly at odds. Mm. And Alia, I'm thinking about Ikela and her relationship to her mother. I mean, when she, when she sets out on this adventure, which is, of course, to repatriate her friend Paloma's mother's um, cor coffin and, and corpse, 
um, she doesn't tell her mother, but her mother's still there in a way. I'm curious about how you navigated that relationship and and um, Ikela's ability to you know, self-realize in the novel. Uh, yes, well, thank you, Karen, for the for the question. For me, the um, the question about motherhood and the relationship between all these mothers and a memory was crucial. If you see Argentina's um, history and you see Chilean history, they're similar in the in the sense that we both had um, both countries had very long, painful, and deadly dictatorships, right? And in Argentina, then, women organized and, and named them, themselves um, Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, so mothers of, of the Mayo uh, Plaza. Um, and then they were the grandmothers, right? Because time kept on passing. And in Chile, uh, women also organized. And if you see, for example, Patricio Guzman uh, documentary, Nostalgia for the Light, it's women looking for their um, lost ones, for the bodies of the disappeared in the desert right so it's it's this role played by women who are not who don't, who don't name uh, themselves women but mothers uh, or grandmothers um in the search of uh, of of their loved ones and who uh, tend to be the bearers of memory the keepers of memory and so we have this daughter who Sikela who's the one of the protagonists of this book um that uh, really need to who also will be because it's it's in her genealogy, right? It's in her. It's 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 written for her. She will be, or she's supposed to be, also the bearer of that memory. Um, and she somehow uh, she she's conflicted with that, and it's and it and it's that conflict, that gray area, what interested me because it's it's too much weight to bear, you know? So if she also needs to be the one to to repatriate this body and, and to to be the bearer of that memory, how how could she possibly imagine a present and a future of her own? Um and 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 how to do that without um breaking uh from her mother. So it's a very tense relationship, but also I think asks questions about femininity and memory and that connection and about the political role of these women in, in, in South America, but in other parts of the world as well. And so for me, what was more interesting was this tension where the mother, um, uh, whose name is Consuelo, um, is really she really wants the daughter to 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 keep on uh, to 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 carry this weight and and the daughter just being unable to do it uh, just not because she doesn't want to or because she doesn't believe it's it's important but because it's too much uh, mm -hmm. so that was what interested me in this in this case that tension that, that difficulty. Yeah, the idea of it being too much, I think, appears in, in all the books, physically too much, um, emotionally too much, the weight of the history and the mem memory. Um, I wanted to, to shift to a question, more of a, I guess, a craft question. Um, I got to read these novels, and I do recommend this all in one go together and got to see sort of how they, they're very different, of course, very different topics and got to see how they talk to each other. They're also incredibly intense, intensive experiences um, to go on. You know, you're in their books that immerse you in, you know, whether it's a journey through Chile, whether it's into battle, whether it's in deep, deep, deep into the, in, into the mind of, of um, Antara and her memories um, and her past. And one of the things that created that, those experiences where you're very, all, all three of you write very viscerally. Uh, a very embodied type of writing, a writing that you really feel, at least I did reading it. And the scenes are, are not always easy um, given the subject matter. And I feel like a lot of them I've experienced. So I'm curious a little bit to know how you get into some of the moments that are so memorable in your book. Um, you know, I'm thinking about young Antara in this ashram witnessing this trance of adults around her and this incredibly disorienting moment or, you know, what it feels like to walk barefoot in, in Pune. I'm saying it, saying it right. Um, yeah. Or Hirut as she's being oftentimes brutalized in the book. 
as is unfortunately her, her fate, or even entering into battle in a state of ecstasy, or, or in, in the remainder where the characters get their hands on these really intensive um, drugs and have just a crazy hallucination that I can still sort of feel on my skin. Um, what, do you, what do you do to get into these moments and to tell these, these experiences? And, and maybe we could start with you, Avni. Um, you know, that was actually a big problem for me when I was writing the book. I, I wrote a lot of drafts um, before I finally figured out, you know, what the voice was going to be um, before I really kind of was able to ground in Anthura in, in a real way. And um, I, I have to say that I think the voice really guided me through the writing process and really helped create a kind of feeling of the visceral. I think it was very specific to um, her particular voice. Um, in the scene you mentioned at the ashram, I, I was really thinking about what I, I was really thinking about memory. I mean, memory is a, a huge theme that runs through burnt sugar. Um, and I was thinking about how memory works and what senses are um, most alive in my own memories. And I think, for example, smell is one that can kind of, um, you know, a whiff of something can bring back memories that you you can't even fathom kind of where they've come from. And so I, I wanted to really, I, I thought that to, I felt that to really get into a sense of what Anthra experienced at the ashram as a young girl. And again, this wasn't, you know, an adult entering the ashram and she's there to kind of enjoy herself and she's there to discover and explore. She's, she's very much there as a hostage. Um, and she's there as a child and she's terrified. And so those things were also, those were kind of layers of experience and emotion that I was trying to um, bring into the scene. But I, I, I really just tried to stick with a very sensory embodied experience of the space and, um, you know, the, the individuals in the space. And that had to be very much sentence by sentence, just moving from sense to sense, to like sensory experience at a very sensory experience level. Um, and so in a way in that scene, I think there's very little idea of the larger picture. And that is, you know, perhaps because a child, I, I think, um, would have trouble grasping um, the enormity of, you know, of what, what she's experiencing. Yeah, I, I really felt, I mean, you feel almost the child getting glimpses of things you don't understand that are kind of overwhelming. So it's really, really amazing, amazing work and amazing writing. Um, Maza, how about, how about, how about you? Uh, yeah, I was, I was really listening carefully to what Avni was saying. And I think in, in some ways our, uh, process uh, might be the same. Uh, I knew that I needed to get beyond just what was happening physically to Hirut, uh, whether she's in battle or whether she is being assaulted. Um, it, it had to do with uh, what it feels like internally, emotionally for those things to happen. And that was perhaps maybe a little bit more difficult than uh, talking about what, what a hand is doing or what a leg is doing or how fast somebody is moving. Um, it had to, I needed to project the, the physical movements. Um, I had to portray those by talking about what, how she was conceiving of it in the process of its happening, which are two different things. Um, and that, took a lot of work. Uh, it took a lot of sitting here, revising and revising, and sometimes um, trying to imagine uh, not what might physically be happening, but what emotionally and mentally might be happening, and then recreating that through, I don't know if this makes sense, but through physical terms. Um, that was a lot. And in order for me to do that, I also had to think about what the other person who might be in that scene was, was doing and thinking and feeling 
because that works in concert with Hirut. Um, and that was as difficult to move in the in the body, so to speak, of someone who's being assaulted and also inhabit the the body of the person who was doing that act. Um, physically, it was grueling emotionally for me. Um, and I found in those moments, especially also with the battle scenes, that uh, once I got up from my desk and I, I might have finished for a day, I had to... I had to be physically active. I think there was so much energy uh, at that point in me that, um, you know, I joined a gym <laughs> and then got out <laughs> some of that or would go for a walk. Yeah, I could see how it get built up. And it's really interesting what you say because you do in those scenes, you do see multiple sides. You're, you're telling a moment from, from several perspectives and in a way force us to also see the humanity, even when it's doing an act of totally inhuman type of act, you do see some element of that, of the aggressor um, on, on looking at the very sides. It's, it's really interesting um, to hear how you went about that. And, and for you, Alia, could you speak to this question a bit? Yes, of course. Uh, I, was, I was thinking, well, for these characters who 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 have inherited um, this um, heavy memory, who are the daughters and sons of people who fought against the dictatorship, but cannot really find a present of their own because they are too um, submerged into that past that they didn't really live through, but and so they don't remember. But it's all they remember. For them, I think um, the body is somehow their first territory. Their one and only uh, um, territory, and 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 it's a body that for me is not divided in these di absurd divisions that we have of mind and body and emotions and 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 reason. So it's all mixed up. Uh, so it, it it really makes a lot of sense what Afni was saying about senses and and what Maza was saying about uh, about this merge. Um, so for me, the fact that these characters are very much um, trying to experience the world and trying to to be present in in a world that that they somehow haven't been able to experience means that they need to go back to the basics <laughs> and the basics um, might be um, taking a drug but the basics might, might is, they have it has to do with the senses and it has to do with experiencing pleasure as well and um, these are queer characters um who who are experiencing sexually as well and it's a it's a reading that that was uh, much more present uh, when the book was translated uh when the book was translated it was even nominated for this lgbt um award and i i was uh, perplexed by the fact that this particular reading was not present in chile as if it was still something we couldn't really talk about and for me it was crucial because the fact that they were uh, also experiencing the world sexually and trying to find a pleasure in this present that, that was too filled with other people's memories was really um, something relevant. And, and when I'm saying that, that it's, it's all merged and it's physical and it's emotional and it's also uh, intellectual, um, for me, uh, that scene that Karen was describing about taking the drugs or, at, or another moment in the book where Felipe and actually eats the eye of a cow and, yes. and he sees through that eye the inside of his own body that mm -hmm. for me in a way also um, represents that urge and despair to really find who they really are you know uh, so yeah, we that sounded have... really weird but yeah <laughs> it's a wonderfully weird book there's so many surreal moments a lot of them really motivated by Felipe who of course is it hadn't occurred to me this idea that these characters are really seeking this physical experience in the body because they want to take contact with their present, having been sort of imposed this, this reality based on the past. There are so many scenes like that where they're seeking out physical experiences. Um, and thank you for those answers. It's great to get a little look inside how you thought about these moments. And memory has come up a lot in the conversation today, and it's certainly a theme in all of the books. 
as is creating some sort of record. And another kind of cool thing as you read these books is you realize that um, in each one, there's a, a photo or several photos that really kind of take on a lot of meaning um, in the book. And also photographers are in the book. Um, actually, in, in each book, there's a photographer. And, and um, I wanted to just ask you to speak a little bit about these images and I'll let you talk about what they are and what they do and, and the decision to kind of, they're almost like a character or a kind of, or maybe sort of a device. I'm thinking about, you know, maybe you could go first, Alia, the photo of, of the parents in the past that, that hangs when they're at a rally um, that sort of is, it's like these images are expected to reveal, but simultaneously are also really, really offering kind of a scrim on, on reality and, and don't always, and, and often conceal more than they show. So maybe we could talk about that a bit. Yeah, well, that particular picture, I had never thought about this aspect of the, of the book. So thank you so much, Karen, uh, for that question. But I think you're totally right that that particular picture is a picture of the parents uh, at a rally in the 70s. And so right before the dictatorship doing that uh, Allende government. And it, it kind of crystallizes and fossilizes a moment of those parents' lives that um, really uh, was crucial for them, right? And it's there as also a monument, um, and a monument that, that again, for the daughter, for Igela, um, is um, perplexing and it's puzzling because the, the present the, that, that she's living through is a present uh, where those kind of political projects have vanished. Um, so she's uh, looking at the picture and wondering, what's beyond it, because a picture is not only what it shows, it, it's a frame, and that frame always leaves a lot outside, and so she wonders about what's left outside, and then, uh, then the photographer comes, uh, comes into, the, into play, which is, um, she's the daughter of, uh, of people who, who went to exile, so she is an isn't Chilean. She's the daughter of a Chilean woman. Um, but, and so her Spanish is not that good because she grew up in Germany and she takes pictures of the most absurd and superficial thing uh, professionally, which is food. So she's a professional food photographer, which is like, I, I think I had never thought about this before, but it, it's in a way it's this contrast of, 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 uh, of things that are considered important and things that are consider considered completely banal and how, how to actually have a political project in a present where those political projects have, um, have, uh, have vanished and have been replaced by a neoliberal capitalist uh, uh, super accelerated world where they cannot imagine a different future. Um, that likely has changed in Chile in the past few years. So we're in a different political moment too. Uh, but for them in that present, growing up in a very neoliberal country, the, the, see, the search for that, uh, for, for those other images, for images that will uh, mean for them having a political um, prospect uh, is, is also relevant. Yeah, and it's interesting that she has this camera with her. Paloma has the camera with her as they go on this journey you know, and, and trying to stake some sort of meaning with their connection to the past and their present. Um, Avni, tell us a little bit about the photo in, in your book and the role of photography in, in the kind of evolution of the relationships between the characters. Yeah, that's such, um, this is such a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, actually, in earlier drafts of Burnt Sugar, um, Anthara was a photographer. And so, you know, photography has been kind of at the center of this novel since, since I conceived of it. Um, so Anthara is, is an artist and uh, she is working on a project. She's been working on this project for many years um, when we, when the novel opens and um, the novel, you know, one of the things we learn is that her mother has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so her mother is losing her memory. And Anthara's artwork actually um, plays with the idea of memory 
Um, she has a photograph, which she claims is a found image. And um, she begins to sketch the photograph. And then she tells the reader that she has lost uh, the photograph. But she continues to work on this project by looking at the drawing that she did the day before. So every day she takes a fresh piece of paper and her you know, pencils and she begins to draw the image from the day before. And what ends up happening is that with each day that passes, um, she moves further and further away from the original image and is kind of, you know, working from just what remains of the day before. And so, of course, there is human error, um, her own biases, her, um, you know, mistakes, uh, days when she's rushed, days when um, she over overdraws the image. And so she moves further and further away from the original. And for me, it was kind of um, the artwork also functioned as a, as a kind of metaphor for memory, how um, memory is something that is constantly shifting and evolving and uh, that we, you know, we move away from the original moment um, every day. And that rehearsal of memory that we experience daily, um, in a way, uh, we put more and more of ourselves into the memory and, and more and more of the way we change. And so for me, I saw, you know, Andrea's artwork, she, she was drawing an image, but at the same time, each day that passed, she was putting more of herself into the image, not necessarily herself in terms of her face, but um, her preoccupations, her ideas, her um, her pain, her issues, her traumas, they, they were beginning to enter um, this image. And it was just an interesting way for me, you know, we, in a way, we, we think that memory is this kind of objective, uh, there's a kind of objectivity that we um, consider when we think about memory, but it's so deeply subjective. And the same with, um, Photography, you know, I think that the images in general, we we kind of take them to have some kind of objective truth uh, at the core, but they're deeply subjective. Thank you for that. Um, it's such a, I always felt like the, the ritual itself became, was grounding for her in a way that, you know, you wondered if there was an artistic project or if it was much more of a, kind of a personal ritual that allowed her to, to, to kind of cope in a way with everything that was going around her. I thought it was such a powerful um, piece of the book. And Maza, a different take on photography, but photography is, I know, very important to you. And the research of historic photos was a huge part of this book. So I'd love to hear you talk about how you approached it and, and the relationship between this story and, and photos. Thank you, Karen. Um, and I have um, really enjoyed listening to Ali and Avni talk about photography in their work. I think there's a lot of overlap. Um, when, when I was thinking about this war of 1935, uh, which was a colonizing attempt, endeavor uh, on the part of Mussolini, I knew that he was aware of the power of photography to create a narrative, but also to manipulate the way that we speak of, uh, of people who are colonized, of Africans, of, of people from um, other parts of the, of the world besides Europe. Um, even Europe, how we speak of the poor has often been um, uh, based on how they've been depicted in, in photographs. Um, he knew how to use that and manipulate it. And I wondered about, um, I had to recognize that in the book, but I also didn't want to subject my characters to that narrative that had been established of East Africans, of people who were colonized uh, across Africa. Um, and it was one of the reasons that I wanted to incorporate uh, photographs, but I didn't want to use the physical photographs in the book. Uh, I decided to describe the images, to create word images. Um, and by doing that, uh, 
it, it's a, a bit of what Aliyah was talking about. I, I could shift the frame and, and broaden it a bit. And I could, in describing the image, I gave, I wanted to give the subjects, uh, the characters in my book, an opportunity to speak back to the camera, an opportunity to talk about who they were before this image was being made and what was happening or what would happen to them right after. Because, um, I think, I, you know, as Avni was saying, photographs tend to contain really just something and then just contain a moment and freeze it and that becomes part of a memory. Um, but if people who were subjected to the, the violence of a, of a camera, of a photograph could speak back, what, could they, what would they say to that photographer? Um, I made one of my other characters um, is it that photographer because I've often wondered what happens to to those people who are constantly behind the lens creating that image? In what way do, do those images reflect them? And how do they curate those images so they can live with themselves after the war? Uh, so all of these questions came up for me and it, it still comes up every time I, I look at a photograph. And was some of the inspiration from the characters taken from photos that you uncovered in your own research? I Absolutely. Think there are those in the in the book. There there are those two images at the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. They're so powerful. And I, I wondered, it, it, did you find those after you had started writing the book, or, or were they part of the beginning inspiration phase? You know, interestingly enough, um, I found those two photographs um, after I had created my characters of Aster and Hirut. But when I saw those photographs, um, I knew instantly who they were to me. They seemed to speak it. When I was creating my Italian characters, though, because they were so hard for me to get into, um, I needed to find their photographs first. Uh, and so I have photographs in my own archives and I would search through them, but I would also go to markets and actively look for baby photographs. Um, I would look for photographs of what, whatever, you know, baby pictures from 1910, 1911, because I thought if I can imagine them as toddlers, that's the only way I can begin to inhabit of them as men doing these really cruel things. So that they work the other way around. Interesting. Um, thank you for all of your comments about about the photo, and it's really, I mean, it was it was a great kind of through line between the books to consider, and I really thought it was a highly effective um, device or, or, or character in the book to use these images. Um, I wanted to ask now a little bit about translation. So this came up. I was fascinated to hear you say, Alia, that your book became sort of a queer book when it came into translation. And um, maybe we can start with you, uh, since your book is, is an, a work of translation into English, or the, the version will have is, is the English version, and talk a little bit about your work with um, your translator, Sophie Hughes. You know, she did, in my opinion, an incredible job in capturing the voices in the book, particularly that of Felipe, <clears throat> the kind of other main character the, for those who haven't read it, we alternate between two, two characters' voices, Michaela and Felipe. Felipe has this manic stream of consciousness really out there and is doing really kind of crazy things too. Um, and you're clearly fluent in English. Did you work closely with Sophie on getting that right? Did you let it go? What were some of your revelations in that process? It was really fascinating and I'm extremely lucky to, to be still working with Sophie now in, in a new translation. I mean, she's doing everything and she asks a few questions uh, about those questions. Um, when, when we first um, met, she, she, we were both in London at the time. So um, I remember she read the book. Uh, she, we did, we, we, we had never met. So she, she phoned me. <laughs> so this stranger phoned me <laughs> and she said, I'm translating this book. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. <laughs> um, so, and then she was like, can we please speak? And, and when we met, um, yeah, and we have become uh, friends since then, but when we met, she, she asked, 
like all the right questions um, because um, for me the the key element about Felipe's voice um, uh, is rhythm and was rhythm. So um, for me, she she was she asked about well, what do we do? What do we do here when when a translation will will maybe alter that melody? Uh, and I immediately realized that she had found that melody in English and that song, um, that rhythm. Uh, it's not the same because um, because words are shorter in English. Um, so in Spanish uh, and in, in, in my book, there are many long words and those long words will create this other rhythm. Um, and, and when she did this, wonderful job of translating Felipe's voice into English, the rhythm was even faster. Uh, it's fast in Spanish, but it's even faster in English. Uh, and, and, and I think it was just, uh, it was shocking and wonderful to, to see how, because it's the only other language I, 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 I do know, which is English. Uh, it was wonderful to kind of see the novel through this other Lens, um, and I, I worked closely with her, but not uh, not that close. I mean, she was the one doing uh, the, the whole thing, and we did meet a few times. Um, when I read out loud, out loud the the Spanish uh, part, the, the parts in Spanish, and so that she wanted to hear that rhythm in Spanish, mm -hmm. and then uh, she did it in English to sort of grasp that translation, um, which is, uh, as I was saying, a, a different rhythm. Um, but it was a wonderful experience for me really um to to all of a sudden see this book uh become something else because it's not exactly my book it's also hers um it's it's her work with her choice of words uh, and a rhythm that that she creates so um and it did become a different book here in, in latin america and chile in particular it's very much so a book about the, the children generation right and it's about memory and that's the main thing and it's, of course, that at least the main thing. But in, in the US, uh, especially, it, it, it became a, a queer book and it became a, a feminist book and it became other things. And that it has been wonderful. Yeah, I would also say a coming of age book very much. Also. These characters. And for, for Maza and Avni, I'm curious, too, in your books, this question of translation. Your books, of course, were both written in English. Um, and that's the, those are the versions we're talking about today. But they, the stories don't take place in English, um, or at least not entirely in English. Um, and I, I'm just curious as you, this is a somewhat vague question, but as you went into the stories, were there elements of translation that you went through as, as authors to capture the story that was perhaps taking place in other languages and other places into an English, English narrative? Um, Avni, do you want to jump in first? Um, sure. I it, it was actually um, a kind of dilemma that I was going through throughout the writing of the book and then through the editing process as well. Because um, actually, I think you know, I did. I think it, it was in India. I think there's so much um, Hinglish spoken, you know, and people I know hate that word, but there it is. It, it's like a um, there's this kind of English and Hindi that's spoken together. And then depending on where you are and which state and city you're in, um, other kind of, you know, a third language might be brought into that. And so I was thinking a lot about English, Hindi and Maharashtran, which is the language um, that that's uh, spoken in Pune as well. So. I, I wanted to bring in these three languages um, at different moments. I knew that the narrator very much would be speaking in English uh, for the most part, but she would, of course, um, you know, bring in these other words and terms and phrases. And some of those phrases would be directly translated into English. And, you know, some would kind of be in their original form. And it was it was sort of a dilemma. You know, what what can I put in English and what can I, what is just essential to keep um, in Hindi. I, I think that, you know, sometimes there's this 
desire to kind of pander, I don't know, there, there's a way in which sometimes I think in publishing, we end up like pandering to this uh, Western audience to a very English speaking audience. And for me, it was important not to do that, to stay true to the um, original uh, words the, to to the way in which they would be used. I had to stay true to my narrator's voice. She would not say certain words in English. She would say them in Hindi or Marathi, and um, you know, especially words. You know, especially with food, I found it was a, a big thing because um, there is just no translation. You know, I, I had a conversation recently with someone where he said, "Well, why do you use the word charpai?" why don't you just call it a day bed? And I just rolled my eyes at him because I said, you know, a charpai and a day bed. I mean, it's just, it's like a world apart. The entire feeling of a charpai, the, the way it's made out of rope, the whole, the experience of sitting on one, everything about it is so different. A charpai is so specific to India. To, it's something you see when you're driving and, you know, you see them on the roadside and sometimes truck drivers are kind of um, taking a nap in them or, you know, sometimes you'll go to visit someone and there'll be someone sitting in a charpai. Um, so it's just, I, there was just a specificity in terms of the language that I didn't realize this would be so important to me, but as I actually sat down to write, I realized it, it's essential, I think, to, to keep uh, certain words in their original. Thank you. And I think it becomes an invitation for the reader to learn something, you know, in, in a case like that. If you don't know what a tripai is, it's pretty easy to find out. And then you realize it's not a day bed. Yeah, know? it's not a day bed, exactly. <laughs> and, and Maza, I'll ask you this question as well, and then afterwards we'll probably wrap up. Just about um, the translations in your yeah. Um, I have been working with uh, my Italian translator um, Anna Nadotti, who whom I knew before, and uh, she had done the translation for um, writers that that I admire, uh, Hisham Matar and Tash Ah, amongst others. So I was very excited to work with her. Um, I knew that she had. Um, she could just hear it. I, I think she could hear the rhythms of of my sentences, and she was already aware of some of the history that I was writing about and had sensitivity to that, which was really important to me. Um, we had some interesting discussions. I, I can read Italian, and we would speak about certain phrases. Um, but I think the, the more interesting conversations we had had to do with uh, the way that fascism changed the Italian language. Um, uh, certain words that I might that my characters would say in English and she we would talk about. She said, well, I could do it this way, which is really a direct translation or there is the, the fascist would say this word this way. And that was interesting. That was a whole other layer to the book that, that I think she really brought out um, with, with the way that authoritarianism really co-opts language. And uh, she recognized that. And that, that made this work really, really fascinating for me. Thank you, Maza. And as much as I want to keep talking, I have more questions and would love to keep the conversation going. We are at time, so I want to say a very big thank you to you, Avni, to you, Maza, and to you, Alia, for today's really enlightening conversation and for your brave, even dangerous truth-telling you do as writers. If you haven't done so, I urge you to buy all of the featured books in this program through Green Apple Books at greenapplebooks.com. They are amazing novels. They will take you to new places and they will stay with you for a long time. So thank you, Green Apple Books. Again, I'm Karen Phillips, um, Executive Director at Words Without Borders, and you've been watching the Bay Area Book Festival. Have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.